Hello everyone and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 275, Climate Change in the 6th Century with Robert Bruton. Today we're going to travel back to the time of Justinian and revisit that most popular of topics, the plague. And not only the plague, but the whole issue of climate change in the 6th century and what role it played in the collapse of Roman fortunes. This is another interview episode, and just in case you're in any doubt, these episodes are not being produced instead of the narrative, but simply to fill the silence that would otherwise be blanketing the feed while I'm off producing an entire season of episodes covering the Latin occupation of Constantinople. Our guest today is Robert Bruton, an American author who fell in love with the Romans while working in former Byzantine lands for the CIA. Since returning to the States, he has written a master's thesis on the role of climate change and plague in the decline of Roman fortunes in the 6th century, and is now writing a trilogy of historical fiction novels about the life of everyone's favourite underappreciated general, Belisarius. Book one of the series introduces Belisarius and follows him to Persia and then on to his successful African campaign, while book two, which has just been published, Empire in Apocalypse, sees the general in Italy just as Yersinia Pestis rears its head. I'll talk more about this trilogy at the end of the episode. Robert took pity on me when I was in the midst of moving house uh, with a small child and recorded this episode on his own. So he's going to take you through what he learnt while writing his thesis, specifically how historians and scientists can now interrogate the natural archives. Things like tree rings, stalactites and pollen samples can tell us a lot about what actually happened in the past, in a way that people like Procopius could only hint at. Then Robert will go into the specific events of 536 AD and the effects on Byzantium and many other peoples from across the world. This, of course, takes in the plague, which followed, as well as global cooling, famine, and migration across Eurasia. He links all this to the problems which Byzantium faced in the second half of Justinian's reign, and on towards Heraclius's war with the Persians. If you're interested in the fiction which this thesis inspired, then stay tuned for the end of the episode. For now, here's Robert. Hello, Robin. Thank you for inviting me to your show. I'm a huge fan of this podcast, and it's an honor to be here. Since you began your podcast a decade ago, scientists have discovered some new primary sources that were not available to previous historians. They call these new sources the natural archives. I recall you mentioned in episode 174 how scientists had looked at soil samples to draw conclusions about agricultural development and compared this data with bookkeeping from monasteries. That's a good example, and I thought your listeners might be interested in hearing about several other natural archives that have been interrogated for information. These natural archives refer to historical evidence in nature and include such things as tree rings, stalactites, ice cores, pollen samples, sediment layers, glaciation, human teeth, and even the study of bugs. We can interrogate natural sources like tree rings, for example, by closely examining tree samples. A wide tree ring generally suggests sufficient sunlight and precipitation, whereas a narrow one suggests reduced solar radiation and drought. An Irish dendrochronologist, the preferred term for tree ring experts, named Mike Bailey, looked at hundreds of trees from the sixth century and found evidence of severely stunted tree growth indicative of extreme cold and reduced precipitation. Scientists have studied, collected thousands of tree samples that offer a continuous record going back to 5500 BC and contain a great deal of information about ancient climate. A second st source are stalactites in caves that reveal the same kind of information. During wet years, the stalactites grow faster than in dry years. Scientists cut them like like a tree stump, and examine the annual rings that are formed. Chemical analysis of these formations reveals ancient levels of sunlight and precipitation. But historians never like to rely on a few threads of evidence, so they compare the evidence from the tree rings with ice cores, for example. 
Ice cores are the vertical plugs taken from glaciers that reveal information about the annual cycle of snowfall and melt. They can also be examined at the molecular level to reveal how much exposure that snow received from solar radiation. The interrogations occur under microscopes and with chemical analysis machines. Ice core samples taken from Greenland, Antarctica, and several glacier mountains reveal record amounts of volcanic ash and vast reductions of solar radiation in the mid-6th century, corroborating Bailey's information that that period was one of the coldest in human history. These same ice cores have also revealed traces of lead that coincide with the rise and decline of silver mining in Spain, an indicator of the health of the currency and the Roman economy. Pollen samples can be extracted from soil and analyzed to reveal what kinds of plants were most common at any particular period. Palynology shows dramatic decreases in the pollens produced by fruit yielding plants that people that fed people in the mid sixth century. That suggests widespread crop failures throughout the empire. Another natural archives that scientists examine is sediment layers. These tell us about the rate of flow of water into a lake, which helps us understand precipitation rates. Reduced sediment generally suggests reduced rainfall, and we see this all over the Byzantine Empire in the 6th century. Similarly, the advance and retreat of mountain glaciers is an indicator of how much snow and snowmelt there is in a particular year. It may not surprise you to know that the 6th century saw the most dramatic advances in glaciation ever. The ice got thicker and began moving into the lower altitudes where the Romans were trying to grow crops in the fertile valleys. A 2015 study of fallen timber from a glacier on Mont Blanc in France, for example, concluded that that glacier made its most significant advance in the 6th century. It's important to note that glacial advances have generally coincided with the decline of ancient civilizations, for example, around 2200 BC, around 1000 BC, and again in late antiquity. While glacier retreats have corresponded with advances in civilization. Finally, bugs can be an indicator of climate change. Bug experts, entomologists, tell us that warmth-loving weevils and beetles in your native Britain retreated from the highlands of Scotland and Wales when the climate cooled to the point where they had to migrate or die. One other natural archive that has offered some new insight into the devastation wrought by disease is teeth. Analysis of human teeth shows severe malnutrition among Romans in the mid-6th century. Additionally, DNA samples from teeth from even the most remote parts of the empire have definitively identified bubonic plague as the mysterious pandemic of 542. We've only just begun to tap the interdisciplinary ways that science can assist historians in filling the gaps left by our primary sources. Part two. Yes, of course. Since you discussed the reign of Justinian more than a decade ago, scientists have made several new discoveries about a catastrophic climate event that struck Byzantium in 536. As you know, the causes for the decline and collapse of the Roman Empire have long preoccupied historians. But until recently, few Roman historians have paid much attention to the role of the most devastating and definitive cause, one of the most significant environmental disasters in human history the climate catastrophe of 536, triggered by a volcanic, violent volcanic eruption. The 536 eruption had a volcanic explosivity index of about 7, or 100 times more powerful than the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79, or Mount St. Helens in 1980. By comparison, the Yellowstone caldera that erupted 640,000 years ago was an 8, launched a 1,000 cubic kilometers of ash into the stratosphere and probably destroyed most animal life in North America. The catas catastrophe of 536 fell short of that, but three massive volcanic eruptions over the span of a few years filled the sky with ash and reduced solar energy around the world for a decade. It caused the late antique Little Ice Age, and more than any other cause, ended any chance that Justinian's Roman Empire had to reconstitute itself after the barbarian invasions of the 4th and 5th centuries.
In a novel I have written on this, I tell the story of the climate change by using St. Brendan the Navigator, a 6th century Irish monk who explored the North Atlantic. He may have been the first person to discover Iceland, and the flowing lava and volcanic explosions there convinced him that he had traveled to hell. Needless to say, he seemed to be convinced that the end of the world was at hand. Anyone remotely familiar with the New Testament will quick, quickly recognize the war, famine, plague, and death so prevalent in the 6th century as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Byzantine historian Procopius blames Justinian for the disasters and departs from his usual dispassionate discourse to accuse the emperor of being the spawn of a demon who had brought, brought the wrath of God upon the empire. While decadence and invasion certainly played a part in Rome's decline, solar cycles, violent volcanic activity, and cooler climate-loving bacteria also played significant roles. Because both ancient and many modern historians rarely knew and barely understood these silent killers, they continued to blame the usual suspects. And who could fault them? However, nearly five centuries after the dawn of the age of science, scholars are finally looking at the data about the role of climate change in history and revising the historical narrative. The natural archives tell the same story and generally complement the evidence offered by traditional written archives. The natural archives can serve as something equivalent to a time machine that allows historians to see the past with more certainty. And yet historians need to exercise caution in deducing the evidence they offer. Trees, rocks, and bugs do not lie but errors can follow if such information is misinterpreted. These natural archives, unavailable to previous historians, now reveal that environmental issues played a significant role in the rise and the decline of the Roman Empire in both the East and the West. Adverse climate change in Europe, North Africa, and even Southwest and Central Asia contributed not only to Rome's inability to feed its population, but also to the Western westward migration of the Huns, the Goths, and the Turks, the southward migration of Germanic and Slavic people, and the northward migration of the Arabs. Finally, bacteria carrying fleas on vermin that thrived under ideal climate conditions set off a time bomb. Harvard historian Michael McCormick has dubbed the sixth century the worst time for humans to be alive. Now, it needs to be said that none of this information is entirely new. Procopius mentioned something about the sun disappearing and frosts in the summer. And I initially thought it strange that a historian would take time to discuss the weather. But other historians in the 6th century mention a dearth of sunlight, food shortages, and even famine in Italy in the late 530s. Now, I need to stop and make one point clear. When we in the 21st century think of climate change, we tend to think of global warming caused by carbon dioxide emissions, but we're not talking about that here. This climate change was all about global cooling. Beginning in 536, geologists tell us that the sun entered one of its cooler periods at the same time that the earth entered a period of unstable tectonic activity that resulted in several devastating earthquakes and at least three major volcanic eruptions in that decade. There is still some debate among scholars about where these volcanoes were, but leading candidates are Iceland, Ilopango in modern El Salvador, and Krakatoa in modern Indonesia. Your listeners must be thinking, well, if this was such a catastrophe, it surely must have affected other civilizations, and indeed it did. For example, the ash buried several Mayan city-states, and those that were not buried experienced mega droughts that caused a hundred year hiatus. We see this in the decline of building during this period. Adverse climate change also contributed to regime change that led to the breakup of Northern Wei China and its eventual unification with the South. British journalist David Keyes discusses this in his book, Catastrophe. Historians are also seeing more evidence that global cooling helped trigger the migration of pastoral and nomadic people of Central Asia and Germanic barbarians from Northern Europe even before 536. Severe droughts in Central Asia in the 540s helped drive Western Turkic tribes to the Black Sea Basin, where they arrived in 625. 
Further evidence of the drying of Central Asia is the shrunken Caspian Sea that is now about 50 meters lower than it was in late antiquity, when it almost coalesced with the now vanishing Aral Sea. Nevertheless, more data would help settle the debate. Your listeners will recall how the Byzantine Empire surged in the early years of Justinian's empire. He reformed the legal code, went on an architectural spending spree, think of Hagia Sophia, and General Flavius Belisarius reconquered North Africa from the Vandals. When Belisarius landed in Italy, it seemed like the whole of the lost Western Empire might soon be reconquered. This climate change was in full swing during the Gothic siege of Rome. The climate change and famine in the late 530s made finding food for both Roman and Gothic armies a real challenge, and the reduced tax revenue from a shrunken economy made it difficult for Justinian to pay his troops on time and send the necessary reinforcements. So, did a drop in temperatures cause the decline of Byzantium? Not exactly. There are dozens of reasons for the decline of the Byzantine Empire. Robin, you've covered most of them in your podcasts. Barbarian invasions and raids, overextension, corruption, loss of talent to the church, succession problems, overtaxation, the wrath of God, etc. The consequences of global cooling resulted in a shorter growing agricultural season, advancing glaciers in the higher latitudes, crop killing summer frosts, food shortages, and famines. However, overall, the Byzantines were coping with these challenges pretty well until they got hit with the double whammy, climate change and the Justinianic plague. Are these two issues related? Yes. How? First, when human immunity declines, human immunity declines when nutrition takes a hit. But more importantly, the drop in temperatures created the perfect environment for the Yersinia pestis bacteria that lives in the gut of the flea that infests rats. There is growing evidence of a direct link between climate change and plague. The dramatic temperature plunge in the late 530s lowered the climatic obstacle that had previously confined the fleas. Studies of gerbil colonies under various environmental conditions in Kazakhstan reveal that temperatures and humidity levels, like those that thrived after 536, created an ideal ecosystem for the fleas that host the Yersinia pestis bacteria. The vast trading network that thrived during early Byzantium undid the empire. In my book, I show the spread of the plague by describing the voyage of a Byzantine silk merchant traveling from India who befriends an infected rat on a ship that eventually brings plague to Egypt and then to Constantinople itself. By 533, the plague may have wiped out half the population in urban areas and hollowed out much of the food-producing countryside. As I read Procopius's account of the plague, it reminded me of scenes from The Walking Dead. In the modern world, there are winners and losers with climate change. It was the same in the 6th century. Byzantium was a loser, as was the Aksumite Empire in modern Ethiopia and Yemen, and the Gupta Empire in India. However, climate change led to greater precipitation in the Arabian Peninsula and a surge in the human and camel populations there. Imagine floods so powerful in what is now bone-dry Yemen that they wiped out one of the largest dams of antiquity. These factors contributed to the relatively easy Arab conquest a century later, when Byzantium and the Aksumites were still struggling from climate change, recurring plague epidemics, and, for Byzantium, a costly war with Persia. The followers of Muhammad were the biggest winners in this climate change. Arab Christians saw the climate catastrophe of 536, the subsequent plague, and the Persian victories over the Eastern Empire as divine punishment for sin and heresy. Many Muslims saw Islam's success as evidence of the favor of Allah and a sign of an imminent apocalypse. This mentality ideally suited the spread of militant Islam, especially after the Battle of the Yarmouk. In the midst of Justinian's revival, an abrupt return of colder and climate and drier conditions dealt Rome a blow from which she never recovered. And just over a century later, the Eastern Empire was little more than a rump state in Greece and Anatolia. <laughs> 
Byzantine Christians seem to have concluded that these were biblical signs that the wrath of God had reached a boiling point and the world was about to end. Historian John of Ephesus described the wine press of God's wrath as people were crushed like grapes. He, along with Procopius and Cassiodorus, noted the unusual coldness, drought, and darkness that lasted for 18 months, and a feeble shadow of the sun shone for only about four hours a day. Fruits did not ripen, and wine tasted like sour grapes. The sun appeared blue from all the ash in the atmosphere. This cold darkness spread across the Eurasian continent in North Africa, and even across the North Sea in your native English homeland. The coldness helped prompt the Romano-Celts to abandon their tiled roofs in favor of rye thatch, since it acted as a better insulator in the colder weather. They also had an abundance of it after they switched crops when warmth-loving Roman wheat failed to grow. After the 5th century Arthurian revival, climate change and disease so devastated the Romano-Celtic residents of Britannia that it opened the door for Angles and Saxons to take over the largely depopulated agricultural wastelands within a century. Historian Peter Heather estimates that the population declined from 3 or 7 million to less than 1 million between the 4th and the 6th centuries. Both the myths in The Death of Arthur and Ragnarok, the Norse Twilight of the Gods, tell the stories of harsh winters and an incinerated earth. They have elements of truth in the wastelands of Britannia and Scandinavia after the eruptions. A diminished Roman Britain succumbed to a colder and drier climate, famine and plague, before the Anglo-Saxons made a second comeback in the mid-6th century during the so-called Migration Cooling Period, after the Romano-Celts had chased the Saxons from Britain's interior and even back to the continent half a century earlier. It's interesting to note that when the second bubonic plague uh, hit Europe in 1347, Constantinople's population declined to about 50,000 people, a tenth of what it had been in Justinian's or Manuel's time. In your podcasts, you've talked about how such devastation can cause many to believe that the emperor's policies or personal life had brought the wrath of God upon his people. Procopius certainly felt that way about Justinian. Indeed, the second half of Justinian's reign was quite different from the first half. The Byzantines built almost no monumental architecture structures after 542. The once thriving city of Rome that hosted an estimated 1 million souls during the early empire was reduced to 10 or 20,000 by the end of the 6th century, and cattle grazed in the forum. And worse, the plague came and went every dozen or so years for two centuries before it finally died out. You've discussed demographic decline before, but to remind your listeners, between 400 and 550, the Eastern Empire's population of approximately 25 or 30 million may have shrunk to between 12 to 19 million. Recurring bouts of plague brought the population closer to a mere 7 to 10 million by the early 9th century. And as we all know, demographics is destiny. In the Western Empire, Justinian was unable to secure his conquests in the Balkans, Italy, Spain, and North Africa. Indeed, Agathias reported that the plague repeatedly hit hard, particularly among military-aged males, probably because of the high density of military camps. You've talked repeatedly about how army resentment over reduced funding to the military provoked mutinies on the frontier and invited foreign invasion. The demographic decline deprived the East of the manpower to plow the fields and field the armies needed to meet the looming threats from Persia and eventually Arab and Turkish armies. Meanwhile, Germanic and Slavic tribes north of the Rhine and Danube suffered much less from Justinian's plague and fled their colder climes by migrating to vacant lands in the south. Historians do not blame Native American chiefs for the smallpox epi epidemic to which their people fell, and nor is it fair to list Justinian among the so-called bad emperors just because his dynamic reign coincided with an unprecedented host of cataclysmic events. Unlucky may be a more fitting moniker. Justinian's 
resurrected empire reestablished the social and trade networks that transformed what might have been a local epidemic in Egypt into an empire-wide pandemic that became the coup de grace for the empire's hopes of a revival. The real price of pearls, silks, and pepper from the East was not gold, but plague. Absent the dual impacts of abrupt climate change and plague, there is no reason to think that the Eastern Roman Empire might not have continued a, a trajectory that was already longer than the entire history of the modern world. Unfortunately, the Justinianic plague did not spur technological and economic growth the way the Black Death spurred late medieval Europe toward innovation and a capitalist economy. Did any good come of it? Well, one silver lining was the way some Byzantine Christians found in the various famines and plagues opportunities to feed the hungry and bury the dead, even as non-Christians practiced little such obligations in charity. Roman citizens had little use for the pagan religions after the plague, and Christian communities that cared for the sick seemed to have had lower mortality rates. Conclusions. Some useful conclusions can be drawn from all of this. First, let me say clearly that environmental factors and climate change did not determine the course of the empire, but they did pose an existential challenge to food production and health and contributed to the inequality of an emerging feudal political system. The decline of the Roman Empire almost perfectly correlated with the onset of a colder, drier, and less stable climate. Deforestation and the increase of reflectivity of the Earth's surface caused a reduction of heat absorption and thereby reduced rainfall, but the 536 catastrophe was the primary culprit. The climate of the Mediterranean region is particularly vulnerable to the impact of anthropogenic activity, and by the late 2nd century, deforestation meant that less rain fell on the empire than during the previous century. Second, the evidence indicates that the environmental catastrophe of 536 was ruinous. Real population and economic growth in Europe was next to nothing between 536 and the Middle Ages. The impact far eclipsed the abdication of the last Roman Empire in 476. I've often given thought that we might consider the somewhat arbitrary date of 476 given to schoolchildren as the official end of the Western Roman Empire, in recognition that the empire thrived in the East for another three generations before it found itself unable to cope with the unprecedented stress of harsh climate and disease. Maybe Mike Duncan's History of Rome podcast should have gone on until 536 and then turned it over to you. Third, it wasn't just climate change that brought down the Byzantines. And this is the point that Professor Kyle Harper makes in his book, The Fate of Rome. The whipsaw of, of climate catastrophe and plague took the last ounce of vitality out of the Roman Empire. The Eastern Empire might have survived just the climate change or the plague, but managing both within the same decade was simply too much for an empire already overwhelmed by invasion and migration. Climate change and disease devastated the agricultural economy, ruined trade, reduced the tax base, drastically diminished the strength of the military, caused famine and civil unrest, undermined confidence in the government's ability to manage its growing problems, and signaled to new aggressors that the time to strike had come. In short, Rome could manipulate nature, but it could never subdue it. Part 3. Yes, indeed. The first part deals with the resurgence of Byzantium that accompanied the conquest of Belisarius. The second deals with the post-apocalyptic world that followed the climate change and plague. And the third reveals the impact of the decline. Belisarius is my chief protagonist, and the trilogy offers some insights into how he coped with the challenges posed by climate change, plague, Justinian, Theodora, and, of course, his wayward wife, Antonina. Thank you, Robert, so much for sharing your conclusions with us. I know many listeners work in the sciences, and if you'd like to know more, you can find Robert's thesis and his bibliography at author Robert Bruton, B-R-U-T-O-N dot com. From there, or from Amazon, you can also buy physical or Kindle copies of Robert's historical fiction. And we'll end today's episode with a little advert from Robert, for book two in his series, 
Empire in Apocalypse. It's 535 AD, and the Eastern Roman Empire thrives under Emperor Justinian. The Romans have thwarted the Persians in the east, and Africa is once again among the Roman provinces. Justinian sends his greatest general, Flavius Belisarius, to Italy to reconquer the Western Empire from the Goths. However, three years after that fateful scene of his wife's infidelity in the cellar of the Vandal King, Belisarius is still a troubled man. He sees her betrayal and the way his servants won't look him in the eye, in the disrespectful smirks from his fellow generals, and in the mesmerizing sway of his wife's hips. Worst of all, he sees it in the charm of a handsome godson who seems to outcompete him for his wife's affection. To distract himself, Belisarius throws himself into the ominous challenge before him, reclaiming Roman lands lost in Italy half a century earlier. Always outnumbered, but rarely outwitted, Belisarius and his 5,000 men occupy and hold Rome against a siege by a 100,000 wild Goths. Despite this, his wife's indiscretions undermine the serenity that should follow his success. Far, far away on a fiery island in the North Atlantic, Hibernian monks investigate a mysterious plume of smoke blanketing the sky and covering the earth in shadows. Their leader, Brendan, makes an ominous discovery about the possibly grim future of humankind and must do whatever it takes to relay the disturbing revelation to the Empress in Constantinople. Belisarius is determined to fight on, regardless of the darkened sky, crop failures, and starvation that vex his men. Against all odds, he completes his conquest of Italy, and upon reaching the capital of Ravenna, the Goths offer him the crown of the Western Empire. To end the bloody war, he pretends to accept the offer, but is recalled to Constantinople before securing the empire's victory. In Constantinople, he faces the judgment of a suspicious imperial couple and the punitive redeployment to a resurgent Persia. Carried on divine winds, Brendan sails across the known world to deliver his foreboding message of the coming apocalypse. Not even Theodora, Empress of the East herself, can discredit the monk's portentous story of the erupting mountain, a darkening over all the earth, and widespread famine. When bubonic plague reaches Constantinople's harbors, unleashing death in the city and threatening the life of Justinian, it seems as though Brendan's prophecy about the end of days has arrived. Belisarius must face the cold, hard truth that Brendan brings— that the new world order he is working to establish may be burning to the ground. <laughs>